I get this from Teams. It's called uh, Seven Principles of Biblical Interpretation. Uh, so that you can read along with us. We're going to read it and we'll talk about it a little bit. And I just need to tell you that he talks about preaching, and, and this is written for pastors or teachers who are, are teaching or preaching the word, but it's applicable, applicable to everyone because you need to, if you're going to study the Bible, you need to know what it's saying, uh, whether or not you're ever going to teach it or be. Okay, so this is by Wayne McDill. The word interpret can uh, be used to mean to understand, to translate, or to explain. These three functions of the interpretive process are also appropriate for preaching. First, we seek to understand what the text is saying. Then we translate that information into the intended theological message. Finally, we explain that message to the congregation. The interpreter needs to have a working knowledge of basic principles of interpretation. These hermeneutical principles are like the tricks of the trade for an interpreter. They guide us in our examination of the text so that our work is kept within the bounds of legitimate hermeneutics, so that we're interpreting it right. The assumption behind these principles is that properly handled, the text will disclose its meaning to the interpreter. Interpreting the Bible, hermeneutics, is the science and art of understanding, translating, and explaining the meaning of the scripture text. To guide this process, the preacher, or the layman, uh, when you see preacher, just put this, insert your name, uh, can follow basic principles that it help interpret, that help the interpreter discern the intended meaning of the text rather than imposing his own ideas on the text. Here are seven principles I would recommend. Number one, identify the kind of literature your text, uh, uh, the kind of literature your text is for insight into its meaning. So, what the type of literature is, whether it's narrative or prophecy, which narrative is Genesis, is a story, prophecy, Isaiah, poetry, the Psalms, history, that's Acts, uh, uh, Mark, the gospel, is it gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or is it epistles, is it a letter, like the letter to, letters to the Corinthians? Uh, and if you, if you look at something um, like Genesis, right, uh, that, that says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a story, right? Uh, and it's a beautiful story, and it's told as a story. It's told as a narrative. If you go to Acts 1, where it just jumps into what was happening in the early church, and it's very historical, and then we went here, and then we went there, and then that's history. You're going to read history differently than narrative. Or if you go to a psalm, and you read in a psalm, uh, you know, um, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil for you are with me. Um, that's, that's very different than, than history and then epistles. So uh, you, you need to know what you're reading. Um, Bible scholars call the genre of the text, call this the genre of the text. That means the general form the text takes, narrative, prophecy, poetry, history, gospel, epistles. The various kinds of literature present their message in different styles with different structure. Narrative texts do not operate the same way as the way epistles do in getting their message across to the reader. Uh, and by the way, sometimes you can have multiple genres in a single book. They're not all cut and dried. Uh, the variety of, in literary forms can, be, uh, can become a complicated study. Bible scholars go beyond the basic forms I mentioned here to subforms and sub-differences the ordinary reader might not notice. Often they disagree with one another about these subtleties. In spite of these technical distinctions, the preacher can still recognize the text's form and how it affects the meaning. Secondly, consider the context of the passage for better, a better understanding of its meaning. Uh, this is often considered the first and most important principle for accurate interpretation. Bible scholars use the term context to discuss very at various aspects of the original writing of the text. Historical, social, political, religious, literary. It is this literary concern I have in mind as the context of the passage. The writer follows a logical line of thought in, in what he writes, what he said in the previous verses or chapters, and what he said uh, in the ones to follow will help make the text in question clear. Taking the text out of that context risks misinterpreting it. 
Often clues in the surrounding verses will open aspects of the meaning uh, in your text you would otherwise have missed. So let me give you a couple examples. Um, there's a very common verse that is often quoted, and it's this. Jesus is speaking in Matthew 18, and he says, Wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. What are people talking? What are they usually referring to in that? Church, yeah, or, or here, right, or a prayer meeting, or a chapel, or whatever. Jesus is there because more than two are gathered. If I'm alone in my room, is Jesus there? Yeah. The context of that verse is actually church discipline. Just before that, Jesus has said, look, if your brother uh, does something against you, go to your brother and try to solve it privately. But if he won't listen, then return with another brother or two and, and try to talk some sense into him. That's the AKB. And if he still doesn't, then turn him over to the church. And then he says, for, for where two or more are gathered, there I am. What he's saying is, you have, you're going with my authority. When you, when you handle church discipline in this biblical way, you have my authority. That makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Um, but if you take it out of its context, it doesn't mean that. Uh, one of the most famous ones is I can do all things through Christ. I'm telling you right now, I cannot go wrong. Point. I love Jesus, but I can't do that. I am physically incapable. It's not about I can do anything I want to do. The context there is Paul saying, I know what it means to have plenty. I know what it means to be in want. Uh, and, and he's talking about Christ's uh, uh, provision for him. And so what he's saying is, no matter what happens to me, I have Christ. That's the concept. Uh, we can win this game tomorrow because we have Jesus in the game. But, you know, I'd love to have that be true, but that's not what this text is saying. Uh, and they probably have to uh, probably the most colorful one that uh, that if you read it out of context, you would say, what? In Galatians, I'm not going to give you the context first. I'm just going to say what Paul wrote. He said this about circumcision. I wish they'd just go the whole way and emasculate themselves. <laughs> what? That's in the Bible? That's in the Bible. <laughs> So he's talking about the gospel, and there's a group of people called the Judaizers who are saying, yes, you need to believe in Jesus, but you also must be circumcised to be saved. So salvation is by Jesus and circumcision. If you haven't been circumcised, you're not saved. And, 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 and Paul calls this no gospel at all. Like if you add anything to say by grace through faith, you no longer have the gospel. You have something other than the gospel. And that's what he's teaching. And he gets really frustrated about it because people are being led astray by this. And so he says, when they're forcing circumcision on themselves, on people, I just wish they'd cut the whole thing off. And it is. It is like jarring, right? But it's Paul. And Paul was a pretty passionate guy, right? Uh but at least it makes more sense. It's still kind of jarring, but at least it makes more sense uh, when you realize the gospel is insane. By the way, that's true of anything that we put alongside Christ. Yeah, you got to believe in Christ, and you got to be baptized. Yeah, you got to believe in Christ, and you have to tithe. Yeah, you have, if you're saying that you're not saved without those things, without those extra things, you have no gospel at all. We are saved by grace through faith, and you'll be memorizing that. Uh, third one, read the text for its plain and obvious meaning. Uh, and, and to do that is a safeguard against making it say what we want it to say, right? If we read it for what it means to me, for what I think it means, then we can just make it say what I want it to say. Um when Jeff was in uh, high school, um, 
his church had a high school, Sunday school teacher who was not exactly working. And he taught these teenagers that when Paul writes about being sexually immoral, he was only referring to adultery. And he told these kids that they could have sex without outside, outside of marriage, and it's no. not a sin. It's the first thing that you can do. If you do a deep Google search, mm -hmm. is it sinful to have sex with another person you don't want to love? Is no, but it's fine. It's just like you're waiting for your friend to leave. Right, right. But that word for sexual immorality literally means any sexual contact outside of marriage. Yep. Any of it. That's well, what it means. And uncovering the business. Yes, yeah. So, um, so it does include adultery, but it includes a whole lot more. And, and uh, that's its plain and obvious meaning. This teacher was making it out not only for what he wanted it to be, but also for what those three boys wanted it to be. Right? <laughs> oh, uh, no. So, yeah, that yeah, was bad. Oh, no. Oh, I can't see. Um, I, I wrote down Hebrews 13.4 here, and I have no idea why. So, does somebody like to tell me what Hebrews 13.4 says? Maybe that will jar. Well, yeah. I've heard a lot about that. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let marriage bed be on the files for God be judged. Yeah, so I think he I think he used that too. That, but 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 to have the marriage bed be undefiled goes both ways, right? Listen, I'm gonna tell you right now. Um, faithfulness to whoever you're gonna marry, both ways. You're faithful to them before you're married to them, when you marry them, and after you marry them. It works better that way. Uh, and that's what the Bible teaches. So a common and persistent myth about the Bible is that the real meaning is hidden behind the surface message. Even though the Bible uses symbolic or figurative language, most of it is clear to the reader. Even when you do not know about the people, places, and events in question, you can grasp the point of the text. The use of figurative language in Scripture only enhances the plain meaning of the text. Why do you complain about the splinter in your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own eye? Jesus said uh, in Matthew 7 through 3, 7 3, uh, even though this is figurative language, we have no trouble understanding what he meant. His use of metaphors makes it even clearer. Try to discern the writer's intentions when he wrote the text. This principle of intentionality is critical for the expository teacher preacher. So Expository just means preaching through a text of scripture. Um, you study the text not to find a sermon in it, but to discover the writer's intended message. Unless you can learn in it the intended meaning of the text uh, writer, you will not be able to preach the message of the text in your sermon. Remember, the text cannot mean what it never meant. That's profound. It seems kind of simple. Yeah. But it cannot mean now what it never meant. Discovering the writer's original meaning is your first task as you prepare to preach to your own generation or as you prepare to learn the Bible. Um, the intended meaning of the text writer will also be the intended meaning of the Holy Spirit who inspired him to write. As you read his words, you are dealing with a revelation from God. Remember, all scripture is God. The same Holy Spirit who inspired these words in the first place wants this message to be preached again through your sermon. And you want to preach it in a way that is in line with the Spirit's purposes. Look carefully at the language of the text or what it reveals about its meaning. Words carry thoughts. The words of the text are all we have of the writer's thoughts. If he hadn't written it down, we wouldn't know what he was thinking. So we can look closely at his words, examining each one carefully for the part it plays in the, his message. Also look at how the words and phrases connect with one another and how the sentences are constructed. If, and I know this makes you a grammar nerd, and not all of you like that as much as I do. Uh, if you can study the text in the original language, you can gain greater insight into the meaning. 
Many preachers study Greek and Hebrew for that reason, but even if you cannot read the Greek texts in those languages, you can still use lexicons and word studies, word study books to guide you. And I've got some over there, and when you do reverse mapping, sometimes you use those. Uh, I'm, I'm not fluent in Greek, but I love learning Greek words. Remember, I've t I taught you in 10th grade when uh, when Jesus said, ego I me, it's I am, right? And, and the meaning of that, that's Yahweh's name. Uh, it's a self, God's self-revelatory name. Uh, and it takes on deeper meaning when you understand that, right? Uh, if you hear him say, I am the way of the truth and the life, Yahweh, the way of the truth and the life, he's, he's everywhere, if you understand the meaning of that, everywhere saying that he is God. Um, Though, you're, uh, though your congregation is probably not interested in the Hebrew and Greek, or it should be, your study will open insights, my congregation here, uh, open, uh, open insights that will make the message clearer to them. You can do this without going into detail about tenses and forms in the original languages. Um, so, uh, do you, I don't know if you remember this about... Uh, about John 11 when we studied Lazarus. But that word uh, for weeping, when, when uh, the people were weeping, is the word kleo, which is loud wailing. So they weren't just, you know, crying like this, you know, muddled cry. They were wailing in grief. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, when it says Jesus was deeply troubled and moved in spirit, that word deeply troubled is this long Greek word, and it means he was angry. Jesus is at the tomb of Lazarus, and he's angry. You angry? Uh, you know, I mean, he, does that make sense? It does, because of what he's angry at. It's a righteous anger at what sin has wrought. Sin brings death. He knew what he was going to do. He wasn't crying and he wasn't emotional because Lazarus was dead. He knew he was going to say, come out, Lazarus, come out. Uh, he had to say Lazarus's name or all the graves would have given up their dead. Uh, and uh, a whole bunch of dead people walking around. Grandma, where'd you do it? Um, I just don't have to. So, okay. yeah, so, so if you don't understand that word, you miss that meaning. You don't understand why Jesus is crying, right? Um, notice the various theological themes of the text. Though a text has one intended meaning, it might have a number of significant theological themes. It can also have a number of different applications. Uh, when you do the structural diagram in your observations, you will list these themes and what the texts say about them. Identifying these themes and understanding how they relate to one another in your text is the most helpful key in grasping its meaning. Here, I, I put wrote down Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, it is, it is basically Abraham's calling. And, and God says to Abraham, I will make a mighty nation from you. And, and he was barren, right? He was, he was childless, and, and he and his wife couldn't have children, or so they thought. And it says, all nations will be blessed through you. There's the immediate meaning of that, right? God is intending to make for himself a people, and he is making himself a people through Abraham and Sarai, right? That's the intended meaning of the original text. There's another thing. All nations will be blessed through you. Messiah is seen in Genesis. Because how will, I, I, it's not saying you will bless all generations. All generations will be blessed through your, through your descendants. It's looking forward. So it, it doesn't change the meaning, right? But it's, it's, another, um, uh, it's another application or another uh, part of that story. I'm going to skip that next. Uh, that, that gets into a little bit trickier stuff that you don't really care about subjects and predicates in that way that I do. Um, always take a God-centered perspective for interpreting your text. Uh, this means looking at the term, the text in terms of what it reveals about God and his dealings with his creation, particularly human beings. This is theological interpretation. It arises from the assumption that the Bible is really God's means of making himself known to us. 
what it says about him will always be this be central to every text so uh, the Bible was not given by God to tell us about ancient religious peoples and how we should all try to be like them it was given to us to tell us about the faithful God whom they either served or denied. Their response is not central to the message. God's will and his involvement with his creation are. Even texts that give instructions as to how we should behave reveal something about God. When we look at the Bible, we shouldn't first look at what does this say to me? What can I learn from this? We should look and say, what is this? What does this passage tell me about God? Because he is central to every word in that book. Questions? You've got about eight minutes. You can work on your uh, his legacy if you want, or you can chat. We've had a long day, I um, That The due date for that, the due date for that is, is the third, is next Wednesday. I just need to get them in a timely manner so that I can edit them and get them ready. So, um, yeah, I don't want to get them on March 1st. Let's put it that way. But it won't be late. Okay. Bye.